Let me start with a question. When someone has a photo that they shot, a group shot, and you happen to be in the photo, and they show it to you, who do you look for first? Now be honest, don't lie, you're in church. Who do you look for first? Well, in most cases, you look for yourself, right? That's just the way we're sort of wired. I mean, what is the most popular kind of photography today? Well, of course, is a selfie. Everybody's taking selfies everywhere. I have people come up to me on occasion, they'll say, can I take a selfie with you? And I'll usually say yes. Uh, these are usually complete strangers. And they come up to me and then they like, because I have to be in the shot with them, they, they grab me, put their face up next to my face. They're holding, you know, their phone out like, like this. Okay, wait, wait, I almost have it. And I'm like pressed up against a complete stranger saying, make this end quickly. But selfies are, are so popular right now. In fact, some people, you've probably heard about this, are literally dying to take selfies. Did you know that in the last few months of 2016, I don't know what it is for this year yet, but in the last months of last year, 73 deaths were directly linked to people taking selfies in dangerous places, like on the train track. Why do people take selfies? On a train track and also in very high places. Here's a couple of photos. You don't want to do this. See this guy? He's got his little selfie stick. This is not a good idea. You don't want to be this other guy either. <laughs> He's like, I jumping, taking a selfie with this selfie stick. And finally, you don't want to be like this guy. This is crazy stuff. But really, this sort of sums up something. And what, what is it? Well, we're living in what one might call a selfie culture. Or to put it in another way, we're living in a selfish culture. I read an interesting article about a book that's been written uh, by two people, Gene Twenge and Keith Campbell, both of them psychologists. And the title of the book is The Narcissism Epidemic. And here's a few quotes from their book. A popular song declares with no apparent sarcasm, I believe the world should revolve around me. They go on to say you can hire fake paparazzi to follow you around, snapping your photo when you go out. Then they pointed out that babies wear bibs embroidered with supermodel or chick magnet on them, and they suck on bling pacifiers while parents read modernized nursery rhymes like this little piggy went to... Prada, they continue on, people try to create a personal brand. It's also known as self-branding, packaging themselves like a product to be sold. And a good example of this, what I have to say, would be uh, the Kardashians. And uh, Kim Kardashian liked to post photographs of her bling uh, on her Instagram account. And as you all know, she was robbed at gunpoint and one of the robbers said he wanted that ring worth $4 million. And so this is the culture we're living in right now. And these folks who wrote this book, The Narcissism Epidemic, came to this conclusion, quote, all of these things are rooted in a single underlying shift in the American psychology, the relentless rise of narcissism in our culture, end quote. So why do I bring all of this up? Well, we're looking at the book of Philippians together. And as I pointed out earlier, the theme of this book is happiness. Now, if you're going to go to the culture and say, how can I be a happy person? The answer would, in so many words, be be a selfish person. Focus on yourself. Love yourself. Think about yourself. Esteem yourself. It's all about self. And the Bible gives a different answer. The Bible, in effect, to loosely paraphrase, tells us if we want to be happy, we should not be selfish, but rather it tells us if we want to be happy, we need to be selfless. And that certainly bubbles up here in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus said, it is more blessed or happy to give than it is to receive. And we think, no, it's more happy to get stuff than it is to give stuff. No, the opposite is the case according to Jesus and the rest of the Bible. 
True fulfillment does not come by putting our needs first, but it comes by putting the needs of others first. And that's why I've called this message Upside Down Living, because that flies in the face of conventional wisdom today. The Bible teaches the way to happiness is sadness. Does that seem strange? Well, it's actually what Jesus said. He said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Another way you could translate it, because remember, whenever you see the word blessed in the Bible, it can be interchanged with the word happy. So in effect, Jesus is saying, happy are the unhappy. <laughs> How could that be? Well, you see, when I come before God and I see myself as I really am, and I'm thus unhappy, I mourn over my sinful condition, and then I turn from my sins and put my trust in Christ, I will find the true happiness that comes from the forgiveness of sins because the Bible says, happy is the man or the woman whose sins are forgiven. And this is so different than what culture tells us, but a lot of people are figuring this out. You've probably heard of Stephen King, very successful author. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he had a serious automobile accident a number of years ago. So he wrote an article about it, and the title of the article was, You Can't Take It With You. Excuse me, the name of the title of the article is, What You Can Pass On. And this is what he says in the article, and I'm quoting. This is Stephen King speaking about his experience. A couple of years ago, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found out why I was lying in a ditch at the side of a country road covered in mud and blood with the tibia of my right leg pointing out the side of my jeans like a branch of a tree taken down in a thunderstorm. I had a master card and my wallet, but when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts MasterCard. King continues, I got a painful but extremely valuable look at life's backstage truths. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed when we go out, but we're just as broke. Warren Buffett, he's gonna go out broke. Bill Gates, going out broke. Tom Hanks, King continues to write, going out broke. Steve King, broke, not a crying dime. All of the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, all the mutual funds you trade, all of this is mostly smoke and mirrors. It's still gonna be quarter past getting late whether you tell the time on a Timex or a Rolex. No matter how large your bank account, no matter how many credit cards you have, sooner or later things will begin to go wrong with the only things you have that you can really call your own your body, your spirit, and your mind. So I want you to consider making your life one long, long gift to others, King writes, and why not? All you have is on loan anyway. All that lasts is what you pass on. Then he concludes, so I ask you to begin giving and continue as you began. I think you'll find in the end you got far more than you ever had and did more good than you had ever dreamed, end quote. Wow, that's amazing conclusions. I, I don't know that uh, Stephen King believes in Jesus Christ, but I'll say this, he has certainly landed on some important biblical principles that tell us that it's not about us. The world does not revolve around us, and if we try to make it revolve around us, we will be very unhappy people. So it's about others, putting others first, but this isn't so easy, is it? Because, well, there are people that just irritate us or uh, we don't like to be around them and sometimes that's our husband or our wife or our parents or our kids or coworkers or people we're around a lot and we say, these people are so irritating. Newsflash, did it ever occur to you that you are an irritating person to someone else I guarantee it's true. I'm sure I'm an irritating person to quite a few people. And so that's something we need to understand. That, you know, there are people that we're not going to necessarily be drawn to, but at the same time we are to love them, especially if they're in the church because we are all part of the family of God. So here's what the Apostle Paul is saying here in Philippians. He's saying you need a new paradigm. You need a new way of thinking. And here it is. Let's read about it. Philippians chapter two. 
starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. We'll stop there. Here are the words of Paul from a modern translation. Same verses. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Are you kidding me? If you live this way, it, it, it'll change everything about your life. You see, because the culture does not say this. And if we go back historically, this is not what we learn from even civilizations. I mean, if you look at all the great kingdoms of the world that have come and gone, everything is always about self. Greece effectively said, be wise, know yourself. Rome said, be strong, discipline yourself. Epicureanism, which is the pursuit of pleasure, says be sensuous, enjoy yourself. Education says be resourceful, educate yourself. Psychology says be confident, assert yourself. Materialism says be possessive, please yourself. Humanism says be capable, believe in yourself. Pride says be superior, promote yourself. Jesus Christ says, be unselfish, humble yourself. Humble myself? That seems like a recipe for disaster in the world today. In fact, when we think of humility and meekness, we don't think of those as virtues. We think of those as deficiencies. But yet, did not Jesus say, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth? And Christ said of himself, I am meek and lowly in heart, so come on to me. But you need to understand there's a big difference between weakness and meekness. Let's say that um, somebody hits you in the face and you don't hit them back. And the reason you don't hit them back is because you're weak and you're afraid. But let's say that you're trained in mixed martial arts. And, uh, and you're quite a street fighter and someone hits you in the face and you don't hit them back. That's not weakness, that's meekness. See, meekness is power under constraint. When someone gets on the back of a stallion and rides it at full speed and then pulls back on the reins and the horse stops, that horse is being meek. It's submitting itself to the, itself to the will of the rider. It has the strength to go on, but it submits. So when I'm being meek, it doesn't mean I'm weak. It means that I'm submitting myself to God. And that is how I am to live as a believer. God is saying you want real happiness and genuine success. Then put Jesus first and others second. In fact, there's a simple acronym you can use to sum it up. J-O-Y. J is for Jesus O is for others, Y is for yourself. You want to live a happy life? You want to live a joyful life? Jesus, others, yourself. Here it is simplified. Following Jesus and loving others. Following Jesus and loving others. What did Jesus say? He said, if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill all of the commandments. See, it's just so simple if we would focus on that. But a lot of times we're not focusing on that. <laughs> we're not putting Jesus first. We're putting ourselves first. And as a result, we find ourselves depressed. Listen, if you find yourself down in the doldrums as a Christian, if you find yourself depressed, I have a 10-step solution to depression. So if you're taking notes, write this down. 10 steps to get rid of your depression. Are you ready? Step number one. Do something for someone who has greater needs than you. Do something for someone 
with greater needs than you. Go to a convalescent home and visit someone who's staying there. Uh, go to Skid Row on one of our missions and reach out to people that are literally living on the street. Go to someone with a need. Go to someone who has a greater need than you. That's step number one. Okay, here's step number two. Repeat step number one nine more times. Now listen, I'm not dismissing clinical depression. I know that can be very real. But I'm just talking about that general kind of depression we can find ourselves in that frankly is sometimes a result of just being selfish. And instead of being selfish, try being selfless. In other words, stop thinking so much about yourself. Proverbs 11.25 says, those that refresh others will be refreshed themselves. As you give out, God will give back to you. Even actress Angelina Jolie figured this out. She made these statements in an interview and I quote, I went through a depression when I was first famous because, she says, what was I famous for? I didn't do anything great and I didn't discover anything wonderful. But then she writes, but when I'm in a refugee camp, my spirit feels better there than anywhere else in the world because I'm surrounded by such truth and family and I feel connected to just being a human being because I'm willing to spend a day in the dirt. Maybe it was important for me to know that and that's better than having an Oscar, end quote. Wow, very insightful and very true. All right, so let's identify some key points here from, um, from Philippians chapter two. If you're taking notes, write this down. Never let selfishness or conceit be your motive. Again, never let selfishness or conceit be your motive. Look at verse three. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. There's a New Living Translation puts it. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. So first I start with self. And it's interesting, before anything else is said, Paul sort of drills down on this because the love of self is probably at the root of maybe all of my problems, but if not all, certainly most of them because we want our own way. James puts it this way in James 4, 1-2. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and you fight for it deep inside yourselves. You want your own way. And by the way, this goes way, way back to our earliest days as a kid. Well, my granddaughter Stella uh, was a very little girl. I remember I took her to a toy store once and um, they had a little dollhouse set up on a small table, a low to the ground that the kids could access. So, you know, the house had little bits of furniture and dolls and such. And she went over and started organizing it and, and putting the little figures in the chairs. I thought, it's so cute. Girls are so, uh, you know, they love to do things like that. And I'm just watching in, in amazement. And I'm thinking this thought to myself, girls are so good. They're just so good. Look at her with a little dollhouse and suddenly a man comes walking in with a little boy about the age of Stella and I'm not making this up this boy was on a leash he had some kind of a harness around the boy some kind of a thing he was wearing and a leash attached to it and the boy would move and he'd pull the boy back and I looked and I thought that's so cruel poor little boy but suddenly here's Stella who has just set up this little dollhouse so perfectly so meticulous in details uh, and this boy is lunging at the dollhouse. He wants to destroy it. And the man is pulling on the leash. And I'm thinking, pull that leash harder. And I just thought to myself, you know what? Boys are bad and girls are good. Well, a couple of days later, uh, uh, we were with uh, Stella and, and her parents. And uh, the, some folks came over and they had their little child with them. Actually, it was more of a, a little toddler baby, so a little younger than Stella. And the little baby reached up on a little table to grab some toy, and Stella took the baby's hand and pushed it away. I thought, oh, no. Girls are bad, too. Hmm. Yeah, we're all bad. <laughs> we're bad to the bone. We're sinners, and we're selfish. I mean, think of all the problems we have in our culture today. 
Think of immorality as an example. Why do people have sex before marriage? Selfishness. Why do they commit adultery? Again, selfishness. Why do most marriages fall apart? If I had to pick one word to sum it up, selfishness. Oh yeah, we could talk about communication breakdown and we could talk about financial disagreements. But really, if you get to the bottom line, it's selfishness. I want that person to do what I want them to do. We won't put that person first. We want to put ourselves first. Talking about immorality, look at all the unwanted pregnancies today. And what do so many do? They go and get an abortion. What's more selfish than that? Since the passing of Roe v. Wade in the early 70s, listen to this, 58 million babies have been aborted. Let me put it more uh, clearly. 58 million unborn children have been murdered in the womb. And to me, this is a travesty. Why? Well, the baby's a burden or an inconvenience to the mother. They say, what about when the mother's life is in danger? Yeah, but now they've become so liberal in the interpretation of that. If the mother even says, well, I just felt a lot of stress from the baby. Oh, well, then you're in some kind of danger. So we'll just go ahead and abort it. By the way, more than 40% of women admit to having an abortion uh, before. So a lot of these women that are getting these abortions have done it before. And the sad thing is, is, is not only is this permitted in our culture today, but it's even encouraged. I don't know why, but I had an issue of Teen Vogue sent to my house the other day. It's probably because I, I stopped paying my subscription. No, really, I'd never have signed up for Teen Vogue, but it shows up at our house. So I'm flipping through this little magazine designed for teenagers, and one headline caught my eye, and the headline said, what to get a friend post-abortion. I'm thinking, what? What kind of a magazine is this? And so this is basically an article about what to do if one of your teenage friends has gotten an abortion. Uh, they suggest that you watch the comedy, All I Want to Do, get the person a girl power hat to deal with the post-abortion physical discomfort and emotional woes. The Teen Vogue offered this counsel. She should not have to feel ashamed because she made the right choice for her situation. And if she's not ready to carry a pregnancy to term, and that's okay, Teen Vogue counsels. And then the article argues she will need a ride and she will need a hug and she will need you, not because the act itself is so terrible, but because the world can be, end quote. To quote the British, that's just rubbish. Are you kidding me? You know what? Here's the reality. Going back to a verse I quoted, James 4, let your tears for the wrong things you've done be shed. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter. You should feel bad. And if you've ever committed this sin, ask God to forgive you. And if you know a girl who is pregnant, by all means, encourage her to carry the baby to term. She does not want to raise the baby as her own. There are many families standing in line more than willing to adopt that child. But it's selfishness. Selfishness. It is at the root of so many problems where it's all about me. Point number two. Always regard others as more important than yourself. Again, look at verse three. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Always regard others as more important than yourself. Now, by the way, this is important because it speaks of thinking. Thinking of others is better than yourself. And the word that Paul uses here for thinking is from a verb that means more than just having an opinion. It refers to a carefully thought out conclusion based on the truth. So here's what it's saying. Don't just pretend others are more important than you. Actually believe they're more important than you because they are more important than you. I mean, where do we get off thinking we're better than somebody else? Think about the thoughts that go 
through our minds, the, the evil thoughts, the horrible things. You know, if you want to know how to best consider someone above yourself, just take a hard look at yourself. Consider your own sins. I mean, really, knowing this about ourselves, how can we be so hard on others? Jeremiah 17.9 asks the question, or makes a statement, the human heart is so desperate and it's so deceitful and wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? The great evangelist D.L. Moody once said, quote, I have more trouble with D.L. Moody than any other man I know, end quote. That's true. I have more trouble with Greg Laurie than any man I know. And you probably have more trouble with yourself as well. I like the statement of Andrew Murray, a great writer, who said, and I quote, the humble person is not one who thinks meanly of himself. He simply does not think of himself at all, end quote. That's real humility. You just honestly are thinking about others all of the time. But here's the super cool thing about that. The fringe benefit is happiness. It seems like, no, think about yourself. Make the world revolve around yourself. Only indulge yourself. That leads to unhappiness and misery and depression. But when you put others first and you think about them as above you because you realize they are above you, suddenly you find yourself a happy person as a result. Isn't that interesting? It's upside down living. The way to happiness is sadness. The way to up is down. Point number three, don't limit your attention to your own personal interests. Again, don't limit your attention to your own personal interests. Look at verse four. It says, look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Notice it says, look out not only for your own interests. You know, you do need to look out for some of your own interests. Hey, we want you to look out for your own interest. We want you to take a shower. Uh, we, we want you to pay your bills. Uh, we want you to be a respectable member of society. Uh, but for some people that's so hard because they're so self-absorbed, all they want to do is think about themselves and talk about themselves. As Benjamin Disraeli once said, quote, talk to a man about himself and he'll listen for hours, end quote. So this is a tall order admittedly. And uh, it's not easy for me and it's not easy for anyone. So how do we do this? Well, we need an example. And we need more than an example. We need help. Who is the greatest example of selflessness and sacrifice? Well, I am. And no, I'm not to joke. Here. Okay. You know that's not true. All right. So who is the greatest example? Well, I think we know. It's Jesus Christ. Let's read about that now. Go to Philippians 2, look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Underline that phrase if you would. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here's the example now. How am I to live a selfless life? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. By the way, this is like theology 101. Paul is describing the mystery of the incarnation. What does that mean? The incarnation is the biblical truth that God was supernaturally conceived in the womb of Mary, who was a virgin. And, uh, and so when he was born, and that little baby uh, was among us, and then the little boy, and then the young man, this baby, this young man was God. He was fully God, 100% God, yet at the same time he was fully man. He was not man becoming a God, that's impossible, 
He was God becoming a man. Verse six says, he was equal with God. That's very important. You see, there was not a moment when Jesus became God, nor was there a moment when Jesus ceased to be God. His deity was pre-human, pre-earthly, pre-Bethlehem, pre-Mary. And he sort of gave a glimpse of his deity on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? He stood up there with Moses on one side and Elijah on the other. And uh, remember Peter was sleeping and he woke up and Jesus was shining as brightly as the sun. Have you ever tried to look straight at the sun? Don't do that, okay? But if you ever have, it's blinding, right? So there was Jesus. It's almost as though he was saying, this is who I am. Here's a quick glimpse. But most of the time when he walked among us, he, he did not shine like the sun. Otherwise, when Judas came to betray him in the garden of Gethsemane, Judas could have just said, look for the guy that glows in the dark. He's not hard to spot. No, Jesus shrouded the glory. He veiled the glory. Uh, he was God, but as the old hymn says, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity. But make no mistake about it, Jesus claimed to be God and he accepted worship as God. You know, when Satan came to Jesus Christ in the temptation in the wilderness and said, why don't you worship me and all these kingdoms will be yours, Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord God in him only shall you serve. So Jesus was making it very clear that worship should only be given to God. On one occasion, when the apostle John was worshiping an angel that delivered a message from heaven, the angel said, don't worship me. No, only God is to be worshiped, yet Jesus accepted worship on many occasions in the Bible. Remember the story of that crippled man who was lowered through the roof before Christ? And he said, your sins are forgiven you. And then the Pharisee said, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus went on to say, just so you know that the Son of Man has power not only uh, to heal, but also to forgive sins. I say to this man, get up, take your bed and walk. And he did. You see, he was God. He claimed to be God. In fact, John 5, 17 says, the Pharisees sought to kill him because he said God was his father continually making himself equal with God. You say, well, why are you bringing this up? Because some people would say Jesus never claimed to be God, but he did, you see. Now, having established the fact that he was God, he also was a man. Verse seven, he made himself of no reputation taking himself the, on himself the form of a bondservant. This word, no reputation, is from the term kenosis, and it means an emptying of himself. He did not empty himself of his divine attributes, but he emptied himself of privilege, meaning he walked among us as a man. When Jesus walked this earth, he was tired like any man. Remember when he fell asleep in the lower part of the boat? He was hungry like any man, like in the temptation in the wilderness. So we read that after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he hungered. He was thirsty like any man. Remember he was there with the woman at the well and he said, can you give me a drink? Listen, he felt sorrow like any man. At the tomb of Lazarus, we read that Jesus wept. He also wept over the city of Jerusalem. And I bring this up because sometimes we might say, well, God doesn't know what it's like to live in this earth. He's up there in heaven, surrounded by angels. He doesn't know what it's like to be tempted and go through hardship and trials. Nothing could be further from the truth. He knows exactly what it's like. And then some. Hebrews 2.17 says it was necessary for Jesus to be in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. He could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people since he himself has gone through suffering and temptation. He's able to help us when we're tempted. Are you being tempted right now? Are you going through hardship right now? Maybe you've been abandoned by friends or even family. And you say, God doesn't know what it's like. He knows exactly what it's like. Jesus was the loneliest man who ever lived. 
Because when he hung there on the cross and the sin of the world was placed upon him who had never sinned in any way, shape, or form and, and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's never been a lonelier man when even the father momentarily turned his face away from the son. So you have a friend in high places. You have someone that understands what you're going through right now. But yet Jesus was a servant. In John chapter 13, there's this remarkable story about the servanthood of Jesus. The disciples come together with him and he gets down and washes their feet. Now, in our culture today, we don't really do this anymore. But uh, back in those days, this was done. You know, with all that dust and dirt out on the streets of Jerusalem and Galilee and elsewhere, they, their feet would be dirty. So the role of a servant was to wash the feet of people when they came in. Again, the role of a servant, not the role of the host. They hired the servant to do that. But the disciples walk in and Jesus gets down in his hands and his knees and he washes their feet. By the way, this included Judas Iscariot. And Jesus knew Judas would betray him. If I knew Judas was gonna betray me, I would not wash his feet, I would break his feet. But Jesus washed them, showing us what a servant looks like. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look, as I said earlier, this is a tall order. We can't do this on our own. We need God's help. We don't need imitation. We need impartation. And by that I mean we don't need to just say, well, I'll try to do it like Jesus did it, and I just hope I can do it. No, no. Lord, you need to impart to me the power to love unlovable people. You need to help me to put the needs of others above myself. I need your help. So you could pray a prayer along the lines of, Lord, I'm not happy with my selfish, me first attitude. I want to live your way, not the world's way. I want to esteem others better than myself. I want this mind to be in me, which was also in you. Impart to me your power, that I might live the way that you want me to live. Why don't we just pray about that right now? Let's all pray. Father, we can't do this on our own. We need divine help. So even at this moment, we would pray you would give us love for the unlovable that you would help us to not be so self-absorbed, but to put the needs of others above our needs and see them as you see them. We want this mind to be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quick poll. How many of you love to exercise? You love to work out? Raise your hand up, okay? I notice it's people kind of doing like this. Yeah, me, it's me. How many of you hate exercise and you hate to work out? Raise your hand up. Oh, interesting. It's about even. Which category do you think I'm in? I'm in the second category. I hate it. I do it but I hate it. And you know, there's reasons, you know, you do it, you wanna stay fit, as fit as you can be, uh, or maybe you go to a doctor and he says, you know what, you need to work out more because uh, maybe you're having heart problems. So you go and buy a treadmill and you buy some other equipment and put it in your house and then you almost have a heart attack when you find out how much it costs, right? I mean, it's crazy, the expense. So then maybe you go and decide to join a gym instead. And let's just be honest, really strange people hang out in gyms, okay? It's a, I go to a gym twice a week, and, and it's, it's a good gym, you know, and I've been to gyms over the years, and there's, there's certain kinds of people in gyms. First of all, there's the guy who always puts too much weight on, on the barbell or whatever it is, too much weight. He does three or four reps. He makes too much noise. But the guy that drives me crazy... And there's always one of these guys in every gym, he's the guy who sweats too much, right? And then they leave the sweat on the bench, you know, it's like, and you go over and you're looking at a pool of sweat. Or 
I knew a guy that used to get on a treadmill and he perspired so much, literally, I'm not exaggerating, there would be puddles around it afterwards. People wouldn't get in the treadmill on his right or his left, you know? So it, there's always these strange people that, that hang up, but you know, maybe you decide, you know, I wanna try to get in shape and exercise a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm up to 100 crunches a day, by the way. Pretty good, yeah. Nestle's crunches, very good. <laughs> How many of you have heard that joke? Raise your hand. Okay, is it not? Most of you didn't. Awesome. Okay. Yes. But then, you know, sometimes if you haven't worked out for a long time, you go to a gym and you maybe overdo it, and then you're so sore the next day, you never want to go back to the gym again. Well, look, we, we need to stay in the best shape we can stay in because the Bible says our body is the temple of God, Right? First uh, Thessalonians 5 says, uh, May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, spirit, soul, and body. I'm not a disembodied spirit. God has placed my soul in a body. So I want to take the best care that I can of this body. The Bible says, of course, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Some will quote that as a rationalization to never work out. But the Bible actually says it profits a little, you know, so it profits some. Now, if you work out and you're more focused on your body than you are on your spirit, you have your priorities out of whack. But if you only think about your spiritual life and you never do anything to maintain your physical health, that also is an imbalance. So you want to find that right balance, that sweet spot in there. And I, I bring that up because that is true spiritually as well. We need to work out what God has worked in. So let's look at our text. It's Philippians 2, starting in verse 12. Paul writes and says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, so I may rejoice in the day of Christ and I have not run in vain or labored in vain. We'll stop there. So Paul says, work out your own salvation. Notice your own. Underline those two words. Your own salvation. You can't hire someone to work out for you. Wouldn't that be nice? You don't feel like going to the gym. Go work out for me, I'll pay you for it. Well, that may benefit the person who's working out, but it won't have any effect on you. You can't have someone get saved for you either. <laughs> it's your own salvation. It's a personal choice. Look at verse 12 again. Paul says, My beloved, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but also more in my absence. Remember, Paul wrote this from prison, and he had a special bond with the Christians in Philippi. That's the epistle that we're looking at, it's to the believers there. We call it the book of Philippians, but it's a, a letter to people living in Philippi. And uh, he loved these folks and they loved him. And so they were in great agony when they found out Paul was in prison. And so he's saying, guys, it's okay. I'm okay and you're okay. Uh, in fact, in verse 12 from the New Living Translation, it would go as follows. Dear friends, you were always so careful to follow my instructions when I was with you, but now that I'm away, you must be even more careful to put into action God's saving work in your lives, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Basically, Paul's saying, look, I know you guys love me, and I love you, and I wish I could be there with you, but I need to tell you something. You need to grow up spiritually. In other words, don't start slacking because I'm not there uh, because it's God that works in you. It's not Paul that works in you, both the will and do of God's good pleasure. It's God that is working in you because there might be some there, there might have been some there, I should say, that thought they needed Paul around to live the Christian life. And how awesome it would have been to have Paul as your pastor, I mean a living, breathing apostle, or John, or James, or some of the others, but Paul's saying, look guys, I, I can't be with you, so you need to grow up spiritually. 
then this can happen with us as well. Uh, we can find ourselves too dependent on people for our spiritual growth. And listen to this, sometimes people can become idols in our life. Uh, this happened to the children of Israel. Uh, Moses led them out of Egypt and through the wilderness. He wasn't able to bring them actually into the promised land, but you remember on one occasion he had to leave the Israelites because God had summoned him to Mount Sinai to receive the commandments. And in his absence, Moses left Aaron, his brother, as their babysitter, which was a very bad choice uh, because everything fell apart because basically after Moses had been gone for a while, the people came to Aaron and they said, uh, hey, where is this man Moses in Exodus 32 who brought us out of Egypt? Make us some gods who can lead us because we don't know where Moses has gone. And why didn't they say, hey, the Lord is the one who's led us out of Egypt? No, they said, Moses did it. Moses led us out of Egypt. And if Moses is gone, we need another God to take his place. So it was Aaron that had the bright idea to bring all of their gold and all their bling. And he was going to melt it in the shape of a golden calf, which would have been one of the images that they would have been accustomed to in Egypt. And, and then they're worshiping this golden calf. Meanwhile, up in Mount Sinai, Moses is done receiving the commandments. He's walking down with these tablets written with the very finger of God. And he hears noise back in the camp. It sounds like some kind of a war. And it turns out they're actually having a party. And he comes down and finds the Israelites dancing naked in front of a golden calf. Not good at all. And Aaron says, I know this looks bad. I can explain everything. <laughs> you see, what happened was we took our gold, we threw it in the fire, and the golden calf came out. So what else could we do? We'd strip off our clothes and worship it. Uh, that's not what happened. You were the one that made the golden calf. You were the one that told him to bring the gold. But here was the problem. Moses was their first God, excuse me, uh, yeah, Moses was their first God and the golden calf was their second. They let Moses take the place of God in their life. Is that happening to you? Is your whole Christian life dependent on someone else? Maybe your parents, maybe your husband or your wife or someone else. And, you know, if they're not around, you just fall apart. As long as a strong believer is in your life, you're good. But the moment they're not there with you, you just collapse. Listen, can I just say two words to you? Grow up. <laughs> Grow up and become a man of God. Grow up and be a woman of God. And build your relationship on God because there's one thing you can be sure of in life. Maybe two things, many more things, but I'll just say two for now. You can always be sure that God will be there for you. And number two, you can always be sure that eventually people will let you down. People will let you down. You know why? Because they're sinful just like you are. <laughs> and we're all gonna fall short. We're all gonna make mistakes. We're all gonna disappoint. You know, maybe that husband uh, walks with the Lord or at least goes to church because the wife does. And so one day if she stops going to church, he stops too. Or the children, you know, they went to church and mom and dad took them. But when they get older, maybe they go to college and they're out on their own, they stop going to church, we must not let people take the place of God in our lives. When the Lord says, have no other gods before me, that would include putting people there as well. So basically, Paul is saying, guys, come on, it's time to grow up. And how are they to do that? Verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the way, Paul did not say work for your own salvation. He said work out your own salvation. You can't work for your salvation. Salvation, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, is a gift to you from God. The Bible says it is uh, by faith through grace uh, that you've been saved. Uh, not of yourself, it's the gift of God. So what does this mean then when Paul says work out your own salvation? Well remember he's addressing these words to Christians. Remember when we started this series we pointed out that he addressed them as saints. Saint is an interchangeable word for Christian. So these words are 
written to believers. He's saying to followers of Jesus and really in effect to us as well, work out your own salvation. Uh, what does this mean? It means to live out one's faith. Another way to translate it would be carry it out correctly. <clears throat> Excuse me, or work it to full completion. Work it to full completion. The idea is take what God has given you and work it out in your life. It would be like a conductor having an incredible musical composition handed to him and there is a whole orchestra. But notes don't jump off of paper and play themselves. You've gotta read the music and then you've gotta play the music. Everybody has to work out their part and play the music. The same is true for us. We need to work out what God has worked in. Actually, the phrase that Paul uses here also could speak of working a mine. Working a mine. You may have heard that there was a gold rush here in California years ago. And the story was there's so much gold in California, you'll find it laying on the streets, you'll find it in the streams. The expression was, there's gold in them thar hills. So people came literally from around the world in what was called the California gold rush. And everyone was looking for the gold. Well, what little gold was around was quickly removed, but there still was gold in the mines. And if people would take the time to go into the mine and dig deeply and be patient, they might find some of that gold. And if they were really persistent, they might find the mother load, right? That big strain of gold deep inside of a mine. So God is saying to you, I've given you all this gold, it's all there, but you gotta work it out. You've gotta mine it. You need to discover it. But then he adds this distinction, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. By the way, Paul is not suggesting you can lose your salvation. I don't really think you can. I think it's a gift given to us by God, but what he is saying is as you work it out, recognize your own inability and innate weakness. Let me say something that might surprise you. The Christian life is not hard to live. It's impossible. It is impossible to live as a Christian in this crazy culture we're in today apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So in my ability, I can't do it. In my strength, I can't keep the commandments. In my own uh, skills, I, I can't do these things God calls me to do. But it is God that works in me both to will and do of his good pleasure. So work it out, carry it to the goal, complete it, but with self-distrust. And by the way, let me just say this to you. If you put your faith in Christ, let me take a quick poll. How many of you have put your faith in Jesus Christ? Raise your hand up. That's pretty much everyone. Uh, one guy over here didn't raise his hand, so I'm gonna be <laughs> directing a number of my remarks to you tonight, sir, because <laughs> I'd like to see you do that. Or maybe you're just sleeping. I'm not sure, but anyway. But I want you to leave this service knowing that your salvation is secure. Let me just fire a few verses at you and I'd encourage you to write these references down because sometimes the devil will attack us and he'll say to us, you're not a Christian. You're a hypocrite. God didn't save you. Christ hasn't come into your life. You psyched yourself into it. This isn't true. The Bible isn't true. None of it's true. Have any of you ever had doubts like that come to your mind? Raise your hand if you have. That's not a sin. That means you're a human. And just because a fiery dart or a doubtful thought comes to your mind doesn't mean that you're not a believer. It just means you're being attacked. So the best way to deflect those flaming arrows that come your way, be it a doubtful thought or a hopeless thought or a lustful thought or a hateful thought or whatever it might be, is filling your mind up with God's word. So the devil attacked Jesus in the wilderness, right? And every time the devil tempted Jesus, Christ came back with these words, it is written. Hey, why don't you turn a rock into a piece of bread? Hey, it is written, Christ says, men shall live by God's word, not by bread alone. Hey, why don't you throw yourself off the top of the temple? It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He came back to God's word over and over. Here's a few verses that 
assure us that we're saved. <laughs> First John 5.10, anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Romans 8.16, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. John 5.24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned and he's crossed over from death to life. He has it. It's yours. God's given it to you. And God's not taking it back. It's yours to keep. And then, of course, my favorite assurance verse, 1 John 5.13, these things we write to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So the next time the devil comes to you and says, how do you know you're a Christian? You know, you're, you're not perfect. You've sinned. Why do you think Christ would forgive you? Well, you know what? The Bible says these things we write to you that believe in the name of son, the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I know it. Quote it out loud. You know, it's not a bad thing to quote verses out loud. When the devil's attacking you, say, no, here's what the Bible says. And you quote the verse. It's a good thing to do. But, you know, sometimes people ask the question, can a Christian lose their salvation? Let me give you a short answer. Ready? No, I don't think so. But let me ask another question that I think addresses a deeper issue. I don't think the question should be, can a Christian lose their salvation? I think the question should be, did that Christian, who's allegedly lost their salvation, ever really have salvation to begin with, you see? Because if they did not bring forth what the Bible calls fruits in keeping with repentance, I would suggest to you that they never were a Christian at all. Hey, just because someone carries a Bible doesn't make them a Christian. Just because someone says, praise the Lord, it doesn't make him a Christian. The Bible says, even the demons believe and tremble. There has to be fruit or results in their life as they work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Remember, Jesus told the parable of the sower, and he talked about that seed that fell on ground that was embedded with rocks. And so the seed sprung up quickly, but because the rocks were in the soil, it could not sink its roots down deeply and it, bla and it died in the blazing sun. And then Jesus went on to say, these are those that hear the word of God. Listen, and they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is that shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off or some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. So you don't work for your salvation, you work it out. Hey, here's something you might want to write down. Here are five litmus tests to show that you are really saved. Five litmus tests. And by the way, they all come from 1 John. Here's number one. If you're really a, a Christian, I'm going to ask you this question. Because someone will say something like this. You know, I tried the whole Christianity thing and it didn't work for me. That drives me crazy when I hear it. Because my answer is, no, you didn't. Well, how do you know? Because Christianity is not an it, it's a him. And it's God Almighty. And when Christ comes into a person's life, he will work in that life. So if it, in quotes, did not work, that's not about him, that's about you. And here's some questions I would ask the person who allegedly, quote, tried the whole Christianity thing, end quote, and it didn't work. Number one, I would ask them, did you confess Jesus Christ as Lord? Because 1 John 4, 15 says, if anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Did you confess Christ as Lord? Did you ever tell anyone you were a Christian? I'm not saying that all you have to do is confess Christ as Lord because you could do that and not be a Christian. But having said that, I think if you are a Christian, you should confess him. Sometimes we have people walk forward in invitations and You've heard me quote the verse where Jesus says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father and the angels in heaven. And the reason I do that is it helps people to see this is a serious commitment that you must make. And I'm not saying that's the only way to confess him, but it certainly is a way to confess him. Being a Christian is not something that is hidden, but is open. Number two, do you obey the commands of Jesus Christ or did you obey them? 
Because 1 John 5, 3 says, this is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome for everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. Did you keep his commandments? Don't tell me you're a Christian and you're blatantly breaking the commandments left and right. If you love him, do what he says. And if you don't do what he says, really how much do you love him? You know, Jesus did not say, uh, you are my friends if you do whatsoever you agree with. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Some will say, well, what if it's hard? So what? If he commands you to do it, you, you do it. It's whatsoever. You say, well, what if you disagree with the Bible? Change your opinion. You're wrong. And the Bible's right. It's as simple as that. Uh, also, that verse says his commandments are not burdensome. You know, do you find the Christian life miserable and confining? Does it seem to you as though God is out to spoil all your fun? I think you're missing the point a little bit because if you've really met Jesus and he's come to take residence in your heart and you really have this love relationship with him, I think you will want to do the things that please him and I think you by nature, and I would also add by a new nature given to you by God, you would not want to do the things that would displease him, okay? Number three, if you're a Christian or if you claim to have been a Christian, were you unhappy or miserable when you're sinning? Were you unhappy or miserable when you're sinning? First John 3, 9 says, everyone that has been born of God does not habitually sin because God's seed remains in him and he's not able habitually to sin because he's been born of God. Listen, a Christian will not be sinless, but a Christian will sin less and less and less. I think what happens is the more you become like Christ, the more you realize you're not like Christ. And the more godly become you become, the more you realize how ungodly you really always were. So there's always the awareness of sin, but at the same time, there is change in our behavior. There is change in our actions. There is change in the things that we say and do. Uh, that's bringing forth fruits in keeping with repentance. But notice that it says that if you are born of God, you will not habitually sin. It doesn't say you won't sin at all. Because some will say, well, I've reached sinless perfection. No, you haven't. No, I have. Well, you're lying, and that's a sin, and you haven't. Because the Bible says that we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we'll never be sinless this side of heaven. But having said that, if you can sin habitually, okay, that's the key. In the Greek it says, if you habitually sin, it's not like, oh, I sin, God, I'm sorry, I repent. That's one thing. It's a person that sin and then sins the next day and the next day. In fact, they're living in a pattern of sin. They're living in a lifestyle of sin. This is the choice they make over and over and over. If you live that way, according to Scripture, you're not really born of God. So there should be kind of a, a misery there. And if you're unhappy in sin, that's good. And if you're happy in sin and you don't feel any conviction or guilt, wow, that's a bad thing actually, you see. I think it comes down to this. It's not that these people are losing their salvation. It's that they never really had salvation to begin with. Look, I know Christians can go astray. I know there can be prodigal sons and daughters. My mother was a prodigal for most of her adult life and came back to faith under the wire shortly before she died. Both of my boys for a time were prodigal sons. They knew what was right. They weren't happy living the way that they were living, but they were living in a way that was not right before the Lord. But thankfully, both of them recommitted their life to the Lord. And I think here's what it comes down to. A true believer will always come back to God. Now, if someone says they're a Christian and they never come back, then I would suggest to you they were never a Christian. But if they're a Christian and they come back, then that shows they're a child of God or we could call them a prodigal. Now you've all heard the story of the prodigal son, right? How many of you have heard the story of the prodigal pig? Yeah, that's in the Bible too, the prodigal pig. It's in 2 Peter 2. It says it would be better if they had never known the right way to live 
than to know it and reject the holy commandments that were given to them. They make this proverb come true. A dog returns to its vomit and a washed pig returns to the mud. I know the Bible is true for many reasons, but here's one. Not just because it predicts the future accurately. Not just because everything that is said I found true in my life, but because I've seen a dog eat its own barf. That's what it's saying. A dog returns to its own vomit. Dogs are so weird that way, right? I watch the dog throw up and eat it. What's going on? What's going on in the dog mind there? Need a hot meal. Blur. There it is. Really? Then later they'll wash it down with some toilet water. Then they'll look us in the face and, and people will say, oh, you know, a dog's mouth is cleaner than a human's. Oh, do you eat barf and drink toilet water? Because that's what that dog just did. So a dog returns to its own vomit. Why does a dog do that? Because it's a dog. And dogs do doggy things. And uh, he's an animal. But people want to treat dogs like little humans. The other day I, I slowed down for a person because they're getting their baby stroller out. And I was so patient. They opened up the back of their SUV and they got it out. It was all pink and frilly. And I'm just waiting, smiling. Oh, wow, you know. And then they pulled a dog out. And I almost, I almost was mad, okay? I mean, really? And they're pushing the dog around. Isn't it interesting? No one pushes cats around in strollers. Why is that? Maybe cats are smart in that regard. I'm not getting in that. Dogs are like, it's great. I'm going to eat barf later. I don't know what's happening. But then there's the pig. You know that some people are buying pigs as pets. The newest craze is a teacup pig which really is a pot-bellied pig. That's what they call it. And it's just a smaller version. And, and you know, there are articles out there telling you it's not like having a dog. They cost more and there's a lot of trouble with them and you, you know, all these issues with pigs. But you don't know, think, I, I want a little pot-bellied pig. I'll carry the little pig around with me and, you know, and I'll get the pig a little outfit and it'll be my little, yeah, you know, the pig would rather be in the slop. And you know why pigs hang out in slop? because that's how they cool off. So a pig is happy cooling off in the slop, right? That's where they want to go. They want to go back to the pig pen. They want to eat all that garbage on the ground. That's a pig, because a dog is a dog, and a pig is a pig, and a horse is a horse, of course, of course. And if you're laughing, you're old, or you've seen the Mr. Red TV show. Maybe you saw it, it rerun. But anyway, here's my simple point. They're just doing what comes by nature. So coming back to the issue I raised earlier, a prodigal will always return to God, but a pig won't. So are you a pig or a prodigal? See, if you're a prodigal, you'll come home to your father. If you're a pig, you'll go back to your own slop or a dog to its own vomit. That is exactly the illustration before us. So don't get mad at me for talking about barf. It's in the Bible. So we have to ask ourselves, which one are we? First John 2, 19 says they went out from us, but they did not really remain with us. And if they had been really part of us, they would have stayed with us. But by going out, they showed they never belonged to us. Isn't that interesting? So a true test is where a person winds up. Let me say that again. A true test is where a person winds up a true believer will always come home eventually. A person who is not a true believer will not. Here's another one to others. Number four, did you keep yourself from the devil? See, if you're really a Christian, if you've really been born of God, you'll keep yourself from the devil. First John 5, 18 says, we know whoever is born of God does not sin, habitually, and he who has been born of God keeps himself from the devil and the wicked one does not touch him. What does it mean to keep themselves from the devil? Well, the idea is that you stay as close to God as you possibly can. See, I don't keep myself saved, but I can keep myself safe. Let me say that again. I don't keep myself saved. That's God's work. He saves me. But I keep myself safe. Because I know there are certain places, if I go there, that's a bad scene for me. 
Like, you know, let me illustrate with food. I know there's certain places, there's certain food I like to eat in that place. And if I go there, I'm going to eat that food. But if I don't go there, I won't eat that fattening food. So I may avoid that place. Uh, so the same is true in life in general. If I go to this party, if I hang out with this person, if I watch this thing on TV, if I go to that website, trouble always follows. Okay, news flash. Don't go to that website. Don't go to that party. Don't hang out with that person. See, but then in the, instead of it, find a better place to go, like church for a midweek Bible study. What a great choice you made. Well done. Pat yourself on the back. Go ahead, try it. It's not that hard. Yeah, that, that looked really weird. Okay. No, but I'm glad you're here. You made a really good choice here uh, for tonight. Replace your ungodly friends with godly friends. Go to websites that will edify you and build you up in your faith. Harvest.org isn't a bad place to go. We have a lot of goodies there. And also we have an app for your phone and daily devotionals and all our messages and all kinds of things. But, you know, replace it with something that's better. The Bible says that we should keep ourselves in the love of God. So the idea of that is, is stay as close as I can to the Lord. And another one, do you love other Christians? If you're really a Christian, you will love other Christians. Why? 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. You know, when you really love someone, you'll love their kids too. You know, and I have friends, they have kids. Hey, I love their kids too. That love extends to the children, right? And in the same way, if we really love God, we'll love his children and we'll want to be with his children. Some people might say, well, you know, I, I can't find a church I really like. And plus, I, I work on Sunday. It's my only day off. Okay, but the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as a matter of some is, but uh, exhort one another, and so much more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Uh, it doesn't say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, unless Sunday is your only day off. Or don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together unless you want to run in a triathlon. Or don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together unless it's a good beach day. No, it says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. To put it in vernacular, don't miss opportunities to be with other Christians for worship in the church, hearing the word of God. I know the church has its flaws. That's because we're in it, right? But just remember that Jesus started and loves the church and Jesus died for the church. And 1 John 5, 1 says, if you love the Father, you'll love his child as well. So if you really love God, you'll love his kids. Now let me turn it around. If you don't love his kids, by that I mean fellow Christians, how much do you love God? How, much, how can you say, you love God who you can't see if you won't love his people who you can see. Start there. And so these are simple litmus tests that show that our faith is real. Here's the key. Look at verse 13. Don't miss this. It is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. So let's look at it again. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which means carry it to the goal, fully complete, like you're in a mine, uh, Fear and trembling was self-distrust. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. It's God working in me. It's not me trying to imitate Jesus. It's Jesus living in me and Jesus living through me, you see. That's where the strength comes I mean, where did you ever get a desire to even want to open the word of God? I'll tell you, that came from God himself. Where did you ever find a desire to want to actually worship God? That too came from the Lord. So that's where we're going to get the desire to will and do of his good pleasure. This is what the Lord wants for each and every one of us. So we can know we're saved. And then we'll know we're safe. We'll get into the rest of it next time because there's some amazing truths in those verses that follow and I don't want to rush over them so I'm going to just put a period on this part of the message and, 
and we'll return to it later because Paul goes on to talk about things that can get in the way of this. And they're very important things for us to understand. But let me just say, you know, some of you maybe have joined us tonight, and most of you have. <laughs> Physically, at least. We're talking about being saved, and you don't even know what we're saying. I think the phrase saved is a perfect expression that's very understandable. Uh, we understand it in other settings. Someone's in a burning building, firefighter rushes in, and what do we say? They were saved, right? Or someone's drowning, and a lifeguard goes and rescues them, what do we say? They were saved. Because they were on the brink of death and someone saved their life. So when we talk about Christ being in life, what do we say? You're saved. Saved. Saved from what? Uh, hell? That's a big one. It's the biggest one of all. You're saved from hell. Because you've believed in Jesus, you're no longer going to hell. And now you're going to heaven. But saved from what else? Saved from the power of sin. I no longer have to be under its control. I've been set free by Christ, saved from any addiction, saved from any vice, saved from anything or anyone, and saved from the power of the devil. Oh man, before I was a Christian, I was like a spiritual dartboard. I had no way to fend off the devil. But because Christ lives in me, we already read there in 1 John, the wicked one touches me not. That doesn't mean the devil can't tempt me because he can and he will. That doesn't mean the devil will not hassle me because he'll do that as well. But what it means is the devil cannot control me and the devil cannot attach himself to me and certainly the devil cannot live inside of me. You know, sometimes people say, I think I have a demon in me. I need to go get delivered. Uh, are you a Christian? Yes, well, God's not into a timeshare program, okay? <laughs> when Christ moves in, the devil moves out. That's as simple as that. As First John said, the wicked one is not attached to you any longer. He's still there in the exterior trying to make havoc, but he needs your cooperation because you're under divine protection. It's almost like you have an ID tag hanging off you now that says, property of Jesus Christ, and the devil can read. And he respects it, but he still wants to make your life hard. And if, you be, if you're listening to him, then you'll have trouble. But if you keep your distance from him and keep your eyes focused on Jesus... Just remember, God will never give you any more than you can handle. 